I believe God is doing something great in the life of our church and, and God has been convicting my heart to have a service like we have today. Today is going to be a commitment style service. I talk to people all the time and I ask, well, are you a believer in God? Are you a child of God? Are you covered by the blood? Are you saved? And I hear the same answer, well, I hope so. And today's service is, today is where you can nail it down. And know without a doubt that you are a child of God today. Know without a doubt that you are covered by the blood today. And as a pastor, I am burdened by the souls of people. And I, as your pastor, I am burdened for you. And I hurt with you. And I praise God for you. And I rejoice with you. And I, I have all the emotions like a father. But I am called by God to be your pastor. And I hurt with you. And I rejoice with you. But let me tell you something. God is already doing something great in our church. And we see it week after week. And and on the way over here to church today, I mean, the Spirit was in the car and we, we knew that God was going to do something great today. And I can feel the Spirit in this place today. And it's just an, an awesome, awesome Spirit and an awesome feel. And I know that God is going to do something great in your life. This week, I've had the privilege, I had the, the awesome privilege to um, say the sinner's prayer with two young girls up in my office the other night, Wednesday night, two young little girls, beautiful little girls, probably elementary school age. And then the other night in the home of a woman or people, I had the awesome opportunity to say the sinner's prayer with a beautiful young lady. And God is doing something. And today's your day. One thing that I've preached to you the whole time I've been your pastor is you better know that you know that you know that you know that you're saved. Because one day the Bible says very plainly that we will stand before God one day. And see, right then it's not a second chance. Right then it's not a time where you decide. Right now is the time you decide whether you will make Jesus Lord of your life. So that's what this service is about today. If you have your Bibles, look with me to Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. And, and I'm reading now the King James this morning, this verse right here. And Jesus had called 70 men, and some of your Bibles say 72, and, and the number doesn't make any difference. But He sent out men to prepare the way for the kingdom of God before Jesus entered into each town. And, and He told them, you're going out like sheep among wolves, and, and you're going to heal, and you're going to cast out demons, and you're going to be my hands and my feet in every town that you go to. And they came back with all excitement and they came back rejoicing at what had happened. And this is where we have the verses right here in Luke chapter 10, 17 through 20. It said, Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the, the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your name is written in heaven. People, that's why we rejoice today, is that one time in your life when you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and be your Lord and your Savior, the Bible says that God wrote your name down in His book called the Lamb's Book of Life. And here's my question for you today. Is your name in that book? Is your name in the Lamb's Book of Life? Has He written it down? Are you covered by the blood of Jesus? And here's the truth. You're either saved or you're not saved. You're either walking with God or you're walking with the devil. You're either a child of God or a child of the devil. And it all comes back to, is your name written down in the book? 
Now today I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to your husband. I'm not talking to your wife. I'm not talking to anybody other than you. So this morning I want you to pay attention to self. I don't want you to try to improve your husband or your wife or your mom and your dad or your child. I'm talking to you this morning. Are you in the book? Is your name written in the book of Lamb? I mean the Lamb's book of life. Is your name there? And that's a question that only you can answer. And you know without a doubt that you're either saved or you're lost. And I want you to understand it, it has no limit of age has no limit of gender. It has no limit of wealth. It is neutral. It shows no favoritism. You're either saved or you're not. So I'm speaking to the youngest person in this building, and I'm also speaking to the eldest person in this building. Is your name in the book? I've had my name in a lot of books. I mean, I, uh, growing up, we all had annuals in school. We, we would have our name and, you know, in the back of the book, it would show your name. It would show everything that you participated. And, you know, I have annuals, a lot of annuals at the house where my name's in that book. When I was born, you know, they write it down. You know, Joey Jones, my name is written down right there. I remember as a ninth grader going to Washington, D.C., and I've shared this with you in President Jimmy Carter, he was president at the time. Him and a foreign dignitary was coming at the, the, one, of the, one of the statues and one of the memorials, Lincoln Memorial. And here comes President Jimmy Carter, and I had an opportunity to shake his hand as a little ninth grade boy, and my name was written in the newspaper. When Lynn and I were married... I, uh, 31 years ago, and by the way, this past Wednesday night was our 31st anniversary, and, and we forgot all about it. I mean, we were, we were focused on different things, and that evening, Lynn said, you know, today's our anniversary. And I mean, we, we were just so busy, we call it life. But I remember 31 years ago, we went to Howard School in Nashville, Tennessee on 2nd Avenue, and we went to the, the records, and we sat before a lady, and we had to sign that book where we were registering to get married. And I want you to understand, our names are still written right there. And I could go on and on and on, but let me tell you something, nothing of value in all those names written now. Here's the only value that I have is that there was a time in my life that I asked Jesus to come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior, and Jesus wrote my name down in the Lamb's book of life. That's all that matters this morning. That's all that really means anything this morning. Yeah, I love my wife. Yeah, I love the experiences that I had. Yeah, I love everything that I've gone through. But let me tell you something. The, the greatest value that I have today is that I'm covered by the blood of Jesus and my name is in the book. But here's my question to you. Is your name in the book? Is your name there? I want you to be able to answer... Are you saved? I don't want to hear, well, I hope so. That's like playing Russian roulette with a, a one bullet and you're thinking, well, this might be the time. I hope, I hope it's not this time. Let me tell you something, people, one out of one dies. You know, I'm not too smart on statistics. I can't even say it right. Statistics. But it's very clear, one out of one dies. And God's going to ask, is your name in the book? He told these disciples, don't rejoice because you can cast out demons. And, and here's the thing, we are to rejoice because we are given the power to cast out demons. And that's not what Jesus is saying. He, he was, he was, he's the one that gave them the authority to cast out the demons. But he said, don't rejoice in this. You rejoice that your name is written in the book, written in heaven, written in the Lamb's book of life. That's what we rejoice in. I want you to understand, and I hear it a lot. You know, we were talking about it even the other night on a Wednesday night Bible study. Different people were sharing testimonies, and they were saying, you know what, sometimes I'm just filled with the Spirit. I just want to shout. And I want you to understand, as a child of God, we have every reason to shout because we're covered by the blood of Jesus. And that's worth rejoicing about. 
And you know, the Bible talks about us grieving the Spirit when we hold back. Let me tell you something. We proclaim the name of Jesus. We proclaim His glory. We proclaim the deity of Christ. We proclaim everything about Jesus because in this world, that's all that matters today. It's just your relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you can't shout in God's house, where can you shout? We've got every reason to shout. We go to a ball game, we shout when UT runs up and down the field or Vanderbilt or I guess I'm going to be a Titans fan this year since Manning retired. But you know what? We go crazy at the ball game. And you know, in Rio, they're going crazy at the Olympics and they're shouting and we've been watching the Olympics and we've been encouraging them on and and we've been shouting in the house. And we've been watching the swimming and the gymnastics and, you know, everything... Related to that. But we get in God's house and we can't shout. We can't proclaim His glory because we're worried about being dignified. We're worried about what others may think. We're worried about, is is this the proper thing to do? When God says, bring me your praise. Bring your worship to me. And everything we do is about glorifying God. And let me tell you something, we can do that if your name's written in the book. Three three simple truths this morning. Why do we rejoice? First of all, we rejoice because we have eternal salvation. In other words, Jesus paid the price at the cross. And because of what He did for us at the cross, we have eternal salvation. And the Bible says that once we give our hearts and our life to Jesus, we become children of God. We are a child of God and we rejoice because we receive all the benefits of being the child of God. I'm I'm the, I'm the, the youngest of six. And my father was Lewis Jones and, and I'm proud to say that that's my father. And everything that he had belonged to me. And I was his child. But once I gave my heart and my life to Jesus, God is my father. I am his child and there's so many benefits to that. First of all, we have a relationship with him. Once you give your heart and your life to Jesus and you're written in the book, you have a relationship and you're instantly, he becomes your father. Man, that's an awesome thing to know we have a Father in heaven. And you know, I preached a message one Sunday about who's your daddy. I mean, it's either God or it's Satan. It's either you're lining up under God and He's your Father or you're following the wiles of the devil. We have a relationship with Him. And the Bible says that we are children of God. And we, the Bible also says that we are adopted into the family. And it's taken from the principle of the old Roman Empire to adoption. The father had complete authority over the child. And I want you to understand there was three truths if you were adopted by by a a man and he was your father. And and the Bible gives a beautiful picture that first of all, when you're adopted, you're a son and you're adopted permanently. A guy couldn't just adopt you one day and give you up today. It was forever. And that's how it is with God, our Father in heaven. It's a forever thing. We have that eternal security where He's not going to put us at the doorstep of somebody else's home and say, you take care of them now. God says, I'm your Father. You're my child. I've adopted you. Also, we have access to the throne. The Bible says as a child of God, We have a Father that knows all of our temptations, knows all of our trials. He is empathetic with what we have gone through. And He can relate to what you're going through. Let me tell you something. There are people in this room, man, you're going through a a rough time right now. And as a child of God, you have access to the Father and he, He fills your hearts. And He knows your pains. And He knows what's going on with you. And the Bible says that we can bring our burdens and our trials and our hearts to the throne of God. And He feels it. I remember there was one time playing ball, you know, in our neighborhood growing up as a kid. And, and I remember one time I, 
I broke a window in our home and and that night when dad came home, my dad liked to smoke a pipe and, and catch up on the newspaper. Back then we read the newspaper. But that night I, I was scared and I said, Dad, I broke a window. He said, son, I know you did. And I was, I was so worried that he was going to be mad. And he said, you know what, it's not like I've never broke a window. And I remember that next day we went to Draper's Hardware in Madison and we, we, we bought another pane of glass, and together we, we fixed that window. I want you to understand, that's how it is with your God in heaven, your Father in heaven. We have a Father in heaven that knows our hearts, knows our pains, and we have access to the throne, and it's because we're written in the Lamb's book of life. And we can approach the throne, and we have access to God, and we have access to His mercy and His love and His grace, and He feels our pains, and He knows what you're going through right now. And you bring your burdens to Him, and you bring your pain to Him, and together you work it out, and together, you know, there are times when you're going through the hurts and the pain. And what you do, you crawl up in the lap of God and He just holds you tight. And He loves on you. That's what it means to be a child of God. We're adopted and we have access. There's also that relationship, but we have a renewal. When a person comes to Jesus for salvation, things are made new. All things that are old, it's gone. The ugliness, the pain, the hurts, they're all in the past. You are new in Christ. There's a renewal going on in Christ. Colossians 2.13 says that everything, and this is, I'm paraphrasing, everything that was dirty and filthy and, and evil about us has been nailed to the cross. Remember we had that service one day where we had the cross down here. And I believe in having object lessons. And we had to cross and people were nailing sins and people were nailing shortcomings and people were nailing their hearts to the cross. We have that because we're in the book of life. There's a renewal because we're cleansed by Him, him and we're changed by Him. And here's something beautiful. We're heirs of God. And just think about this, when you're covered by the blood of Jesus and you're a child of God and and you're written in the Lamb's book of life, you're an heir to everything that God has. And all through the Bible, especially in the Psalms, it, it goes time and time again, God will say, everything is mine. And here's the truth, it belongs to God, it belongs to you as a child of God. And the Bible says that we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. See, that ought to make you rejoice right there. That ought to get you happy right there, knowing that everything that God has belongs to you. You know, when when, uh, mom and dad passed away, mom passed away first, and and then about four years later, my father passed away. And I remember me and my brothers and sisters, we were, you know, going through all his belongings and and we would walk through the house and we would, you know, we had a simple system where if you wanted something that belonged to dad and mom, you would put your sticker on that item. And if there were more than one sticker, we would kind of bargain, well, you take this and I'll take this. And, but you know, think about it, it all belonged to, to my father and my mother. And today I have a couple of things in our home that was part of mom and dad's. But I want you to understand, when you are a child of God, everything is yours. Because it all belongs to God. All the riches that He has is yours. And see, it's because you are covered by the blood. You are written in the Lamb's book of life. You are a child of God. You're an heir of God. Here's the thing, He delivers us. Daniel prophesied about this and, and Daniel 12, but let me read just one verse. It says, at that time your people, everyone whose name is written in the book will be delivered. See, God says, I'm going to deliver you because I love you. You're my people, I'm your God. 
See, we rejoice today of all these things because of eternal salvation. But here's the second thing. We, we rejoice because today because of our eternal security. When, when Jesus said, rejoice because your name is written in the book of life. It is a verb saying it's being written. It is written. And with it, it means that no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. It means eternal security. Now, we have Bible studies and we debate this, you know, whether you're once saved or always saved or can you lose your salvation. Here, here's the thing. It hurts me if I try to figure it out. You know, because I'm not smart enough to figure it out. I just go by what the Word of God says. And the Bible says that He's got everything under control and He's, you know, we have that eternal security. And see, we rejoice because of that. Third thing, we rejoice because of eternal satisfaction. You think about all the promises in the Word of God. And I, I wrote down things. The Bible says once you're a child of God and you're written in the book, there's no more tears, no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sin, no more sinners, no, no sun, night, curse, no temple. And here's the things that will be there. God will be with His people. The Lamb will be with His people. And it talks about jasper walls and pretty gates and golden streets. The redeemed, the glory of God. And here's the thing. If you're a child of God, your home is there. And here's the thing. We all have loved ones that have gone on and, and they've received a promise a little bit sooner than we have. But because of this book, because of the Lamb's book of life, because of what Jesus did on the cross, when He was leaving His disciples, He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And He said, because I'm going to prepare a place for you, I'm coming back for you. And He said, where I am, there you may be also. And it goes on and on. And you know, the thing about it is, we have, we have this eternal satisfaction. Jesus made many promises. But he made this promise in, in John chapter 10 when he was talking about his sheep. He said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and no one will snatch them from me. See, some of you have made decisions to receive Jesus as Lord. And you've surrendered your life to him. And the Bible says that you're held in His hand and no one can snatch you from Him. But it leads me to my opening question. Are you in the book? And like I said, I'm not talking to your husband or your wife or your kids or whomever. I'm talking to you. Are you in the book? We've been studying Revelation and here's one scene in Revelation that we we find in Revelation chapter 20, 11 through 15, the judgment of the dead. He said, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, and the earth and the, the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And the death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And the lake of fire is the second death. And anyone's name, or anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life, was thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus said in another place in Matthew 7, 20-23, He says, By your fruits you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does my will or my Father who is in heaven. 
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Are you in the book? Well, Brother Joey, I've been in church my whole life. Are you in the book? Yes. Well, I've been, a, I've been a teacher of Sunday school for a long time. Are you in the book? I've been baptized, Brother Joey. Are you in the book? Well, I'm a member of Flew Ellen Baptist Church. Are you in the book? Well, I'm better than so and so. Are you in the book? See, I want you to understand, when we stand before God, He's not going to hear anything. He's going to say, He's going to look, is your name written in the book? And it's either there or it's not there. And only you can decide, am I going to follow Jesus? Am I going to give my life to Jesus? Am I going to surrender my life to Jesus? Am I going to become a new creation in Jesus? Am I going to give all for Jesus and be in the book? Only you can decide that. And Jesus made the way. When Jesus went to the cross, the Bible says that He died for the unjust. He died while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Just so that we could get in this book. But here's the thing. People reject it and people say, well, I'll work on it later. I'll, I'll, I'll just, you know, I'm better than so and so. But you're going to stand before God and He's going to say, are you in the book? Are you covered by the blood? Are you my child? It's been, it's been hurting me because I've been looking at all statistics and and I mean, there's different st statistics. I swear I'm having a problem with that word. Statistics. And it's saying that maybe 30% of the people are saved in the church. And we probably have two, 250 today. That means that maybe 60 of you are saved. Maybe 70 of you are saved. Maybe 80 of you are saved. But I'm talking to you. Are you saved? Are you in the book? How do I become a Christian? People say, well, how, how do I do it? And here's the thing, it's so simple. Sometimes we, we, we make it too simple and we make it a, an easy believism, but it's so simple. First of all, you've got to admit that you're a sinner. Admit that you do wrong. Admit that you have a problem. Admit, before you can receive healing, you've got to admit there's something wrong. Admit that, that you need God. That you're lost without Jesus. Admit it. But then you got to confess. The Bible says, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. You've got to confess that Jesus is Lord. Confess that Jesus is God's Son. Confess that Jesus went to the cross for our sins and because of our sins we're separated from God and confess that only through the blood of Jesus we're saved. Confess that He is Lord. Confess that He is King and King and Lord of Lords. Confess that He went to the cross, that He was nailed to the cross for our sins, that He died for our sins, that He was placed in the tomb for our sins. But three day, days later, He rose from the grave because of our sins. Amen. You confess. And you believe. It's not very hard. Are you in the book? And right now, I just want you to bow your head. I just want to talk to you for a second.
If I were to die today, and I'm talking to everyone in this room, if I were to die today and I'm standing before God in heaven, and He was asking you why I would let you in heaven, would you, would you lean on your abilities? Would you, would you say, well, God, I'm, I'm a pretty good guy? Would you start talking about everything that you had done? Or would you look at God and say, I don't deserve it. Because I am a sinner. I am lost. I am separated. Would you right now confess that you need Jesus? Would you confess in your heart right now that you want to give your heart and your life to Jesus because you are a sinner and you know that only through Jesus you have salvation? Would you right now just be honest with yourself and and it's like I've said, you better know that you know that you know. And from this moment on, I don't want to hear someone say, I, I hope that I'm saved. I, I want you to know without a doubt that you're saved. So if you believe that you're a sinner and you're separated from God, and, and you may have prayed this prayer one time in your life, you may have prayed it a, a hundred times. But if you want to have no doubt and if you want to just lock it in this morning, I want you to say this prayer after me. And you can, you can say it out loud. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that my sins separate me from you. I know that I'm lost without you. And God, I know that I need you. Jesus, I know that you went to the cross for my sins. And you died for my sins. And you were buried because of my sins. And you rose from the grave three days later. Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart and cover me with your blood and be Lord of my life. And I will live for you. And I will love others for you. And I will tell others about you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for being my God and allow me to be your people. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.